Hey, Pastor Kyle here. I just want to thank you for clicking and checking out this resource. Hey, do me a favor. If you want to keep updated with all of our live videos, Sunday morning live streams, or any other video, just click the subscribe button so you'll get notified when we go live each week. Also, if you would like to give or find out more about the ministry at Crossview Church, you can check out some of the links below the video and click there to learn more. Well, I pray that this video and this lesson be a blessing to you. I pray for your week, and, and may God bless you and keep you. Well, as Kaylee was talking with the kids this morning up here, she mentioned to them that, or at least she asked them, if they had ever had a promise made to them that was then broken. And I don't think it would be any exaggeration to say that on some level, every one of us has experienced the sting of deception and the pain that comes along with someone's false promises or lies to us when they're broken. We live in a world that is just continually trying to deceive us. Do you ever feel deceived? I don't know, when you turn on the news, or when you listen to a presidential debate, or when you hear the reasons of why we need to do all the things we need to do in the world, pay more taxes, give to something else. It seems like there's potential for deception everywhere. And I would argue that one of the marks, one of the distinguishing marks of the broken world the world that is under Satan's influence, who is the father of lies, one of the distinguishing marks of the broken world is a lack of integrity. Now, integrity itself is, is more than simply not being deceitful. It's more than not being slipshod. It, it means doing everything heartily as unto the Lord. And a longtime pastor, Harry Ironside, learned this at a very early stage in life while working for a Christian shoemaker. This is from Harry's young life. He was in a job there, and his, his role was to prepare the leather for the soles of the shoes. And he would cut the cowhide down to size, soak it in water, and then pound it with a flat-headed hammer until it was hard and dry. And this was a wearisome and long process, and Harry wished that it could be avoided. He would often go to another shoe shop nearby and watch that maker, the employer's competitor, and see how he did it. And this man did not pound the leather after it came out of the water. Instead, he immediately nailed it to the shoe. One day, Harry approached the shoemaker and said, I noticed that you put the soles on while they're still wet. Are they just as good as if they had been pounded? And with a wink and a cynical smile, the man replied, No, but they come back much quicker this way, my boy. Young Harry hurried back to his boss and suggested that perhaps they were wasting their time by drying out the leather so carefully. Upon hearing this, his employer took his Bible, read Colossians 3.23 to him, and said, Harry... I don't make shoes just for the money. I'm doing it for the glory of God. If at the judgment seat of Christ I should have to view every shoe I've ever made, I don't want to hear the Lord say, Dan, that was a poor job. You didn't do your best. I want to see his smile and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. It was a lesson in practical Christian integrity that Harry never forgot. Integrity. It's a word that's too often missing in our vocabulary today. Integrity is one of my favorite topics, one of my favorite things to teach on. The, the principles of integrity were pounded into my brain, into my mind during basic training with the Air Force as, as our core values were stated, integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. But we had to learn that first part in order for the other two to ever even be applicable. Integrity first. Now, integrity itself is a broad concept, and there's many different ways to define it, but perhaps a couple people can help us understand it from different perspectives. Warren Wearsby says, integrity is being the same person in the dark that we are in the light. 
R. Kent Hughes, another pastor, says, integrity characterizes the entire person, not just part of him. He is righteous and honest through and through. He is not only that inside, but also in outer action. We become people of integrity when we say what we mean and when we mean what we say, when we say what we'll do and then we commit to following through on it. We become people of integrity when we commit to honest dealings and the truth. Maybe just one more quote because it's so good. David Jeremiah says, integrity is keeping a commitment even after circumstances have changed. As Christ's people, we must be deeply concerned about our character and especially our integrity. Lack of integrity destroys things, as deception tends to do. Lack of integrity destroys marriages. It ruins friendships. We see it over and over again as it tears down ministries that have been built up. So often we see that in the news, a Christian minister who maybe had given his entire life to the service of the church and to ministry makes a mistake of integrity, and not only is his reputation now tarnished in many situations, all of the ministry that he spent his entire life building starts crumbling and falling down because of a lack of integrity. Now, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, which is where we're going to be this morning, if you have your Bibles or devices with you, he addresses the topic of integrity by pointing to a system of oath-taking that had become, uh, be, become infectious in the religious leaders of the day, a system in which they were even beginning to teach to others. As we'll see, it wasn't a system that was built upon high expectations of truth and honesty, but instead it was a system designed to circumvent God's Word and in doing so became a system, instead of integrity, a system of deception. So let's read about this. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37, the Word says, Again you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great King. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Let's pray. Father, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not, make us. For your Son's sake, and in His name we pray. Amen. We're going to start looking at this by first stepping back from the understanding of integrity for just a moment and try to figure out what exactly is the problem with promises. See, Jesus here again, as He has been, as we've proceeded through the Sermon on the Mount, He takes an antithetical style to His teaching, and He goes right at this practice of oath-taking. And so, our first question, which would be a good question to ask, is does this mean that we should avoid all promises, all swearing, all oath-taking altogether? We should never do any of it. This is actually the position that some have taken, our, our Quaker friends and even some of our Anabaptist cousins and, and in our Anabaptist heritage, they have kind of taken this very literal view that Jesus is proclaiming an ultimatum. He's saying, under no circumstances are you to ever commit to a promise or an oath. Well, I don't know that that's exactly the truth. We need to look at this a little bit closer. I think it's more nuanced than that. I don't think Jesus is giving us a specific ultimatum that we can never, ever have biblical promise-making. So let's start by looking at where is Jesus even getting this information, that what they have heard or what, what they have heard said was to keep their promises to God. Well, first, we go to the Old Testament. There's many examples. I'm going to give you just a couple. In Numbers chapter 30, verse 2, it says, if a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. 
And then in Deuteronomy chapter 23, if, if you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it. So at some level here, the Old Testament seems to be affirming the practice of oath-taking. It seems to be giving us a biblical grounds for taking oaths. In fact, in the New Testament, if we bring it into that portion of Scripture, in Hebrews chapter 6, we even see God saying, uh, or we, we hear of God when He says, when God made a promise to Abraham, since He had no one greater by whom to swear, He swore by Himself. The example of God Himself swearing an oath. In fact, God swears to God. It's the only person that he could possibly swear to, the greatest being in the universe. It's God himself, and he swears by his own name to fulfill and to keep his promise. So there's clearly a case to be made for some kind of oath-keeping. It would be a contradiction to assume that all of these Old Testament Scriptures and even portions of the New Testament were inaccurate or wrong. So it can't be that. We must look a bit deeper. We need to understand exactly what biblical oath-taking was supposed to be about. What's the purpose of an oath? Why would we take one? Why, in fact, would God Himself swear an oath on His own name? Well, not much further in verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 6, we're given a clue. It says, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of His purpose, He guaranteed it with an oath. Here's the principle that we learn. Biblical oaths are designed to make truthfulness more solemn and secure. God gives us an opportunity to take oaths, and in fact, He takes an oath to make the weightiness and the truthfulness and the solemnness of His promise more secure. This is the biblical kind of oath-taking. This is the kind of oath-taking we see, for instance, in the courtroom where a witness takes the stand. And we all know the words. We've watched enough Law & Order SVU. Is it SVU or SUV? Either one. We know what they say when they get to the witness stand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And the purpose for that is because we know the weightiness, the importance, and the seriousness with which that person's testimony may have on the impact of a trial, and in fact, may have on the impact of a a person's life and livelihood. If a person is facing a life or death sentence, we want to be sure that we are making the truthfulness of the witness's testimony of the utmost importance. And the way we do that is by having them swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that really gets at the heart of what a biblical oath is. So, let me put your minds at ease. If you have been called to serve as a witness and give testimony in a courtroom, Jesus is not here telling you that you cannot swear to tell the truth in that situation. Because there's a different kind of swearing that Jesus is targeting and going after. There's a kind of swearing that is deceptive. And this is the kind of swearing that was happening in Jesus' day, that was being taught and was being used by especially the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, but of course, the disciples of those people, the ones learning from them, were doing it as well. They were building a system of oath-keeping that was founded on deceptive practices and ideas. Instead of building and making integrity and truthfulness more solemn and secure, they were giving themselves little outs here and there. They were plugging little things into their promises and their oaths so that they could then back out of them and not keep them, so that they could essentially become liars, although, of course, they wouldn't have called themselves that. I like to call these things fine print promises, invoking all kinds of exaggerated language in order to give credibility to your words. And in the case here that Jesus points out, we see that in some sense they were swearing to many different things. They were swearing to heaven. 
They were swearing by earth. They were swearing by Jerusalem. They were swearing even by the hair on their own heads. And what Jesus essentially tells them is every time you do this, you think that what you're doing is creating for yourself an out. Because you've sworn by something lesser, then if you don't keep it, the punishment's not as big a deal. Or maybe, in fact, the punishment isn't there at all. The, the Jews had a, a, an entire book written on carrying out these types of laws. And in fact, they dedicate an entire chapter to explaining all of the different kinds of oaths you could make and the language you could use that either left you being guilty if you decided not to keep it or not guilty. The only thing I can find in our world that I think we could all understand if you've ever had to pay taxes before is the IRS and the tax system we have. We have a system in the United States where you have to figure out how much you owe in taxes, and if you happen to be wrong, then you go to jail. And you could call and ask the IRS, could you tell me how much I owe, and what do they say? No, you have to figure that out. Here's the book, slash books. And, and every tax season, I thank God for those of you who are experts in tax, accountants, CPAs. You are a blessing to us, because without you, I don't know that I could ever navigate all of the regulations and rules and the deductions and the discounts. It's so convoluted and it's so confusing. And this is exactly the kind of system that the religious leaders had built around oath keeping. So, for example, if you swear by Jerusalem, you can consider yourself let out of that promise if you later decide you can't fulfill it. But if you swear toward Jerusalem, just a slight change of word, you are now bound by that oath, and you cannot back out of it. Now, how silly and ridiculous does that sound? But if you are careful, you can hide that language into your promise keeping. And now, all of a sudden, you can backslide on deals. You can snake and maneuver your way out of having to to follow through on your promises. Essentially, you can cheat and lie to people. Jesus points out how ridiculous this is at first, but also He says, Don't you realize you're not fooling God? All of these things eventually lead us back to God. He is behind all of our promises. He's the only real true authority that we have in the universe, the only one that we could really truly swear by. And because of that, all of these so-called secondary promises are just like dust in the wind. They're meaningless. God is always inside, behind, under, around everything. You can't even change the color on your hair of your hair on your head. I, I promise you, you can't regrow it, let alone make a promise by it. Jesus is pointing out how ridiculous this is. But let's just take a minute and ask ourselves, why would the religious leaders even want to create a system like this in the first place that seems absurd from our point of view. From our perspective, it seems a bit absurd. Why would they go through all of the lengths to write deeply about how to cheat people in your promises? The simple answer is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. If lying is sinful… And if at the same time we have to be the ones who save ourselves by our own righteousness, then we need to change the definition of what lying is. You follow me? We can't let lying continue to be normal lying if I know that I'm incapable of doing it myself. I am in charge of my own righteousness. I'm in charge of getting myself into heaven by the way that I think, act, and behave. So, in order to not be called a liar, I need to figure out a standard. I need to redefine a new system that takes lying and honesty and integrity from God's standard, and it drops it down to a place where I can achieve it. It makes it attainable so that at the end of the day, if I have to back out of a promise that I've made, you can't call me a liar. I can say, well, technically, 
I didn't say, I swear toward Jerusalem. I said, I swear by Jerusalem. So therefore, I can break this promise. You know, we don't have to try to raise children to be dishonest. They just do that on their own. They're born with a nature that is prone to lying. And we see it all the time. It's a natural instinct. And the first time it really starts to strike is when they understand the difference between right and wrong, and they start to recognize that they might be punished for having not done something they were supposed to do or for having done something that they weren't supposed to do. Watch how quickly a toddler learns to lie. No one has to teach them this. They just instinctively begin to do it. And that's how we were all born into this exact same type of nature where lying just comes natural because it's from our nature, our sinful nature. And in fact, James tells us that if we have lied even once, if we have broken the law by, by having a lack of integrity, even just one time in our life where we all know that we've done it more than that, but even just once, then we have broken all of the law. We can no longer, not, if we, not as if we ever really could in the first place, but we could no longer have a shot at self-righteousness. Have you ever made false promises? Now, I think immediately your mind is probably wandering into actual promises that you've ever made. Maybe you're reflecting on your elementary years where you made the cross my heart, hope to die promise. Maybe like Kaylee was talking this morning, you've made your pinky promises with your friends, the ones that you surely broke. But I want to I raise the standard of integrity to beyond more than simply our childish games and more than just our little offhand promises that we've made. So, let's test ourselves by asking these questions. Have we made false promises? And here's some of the things we can do or we can ask ourselves to find out if we've ever done this. Do you ever bend the truth? Do you ever tell little white lies? Do you ever justify it by saying, I'm just protecting their feelings? My initial thought when I heard this question, do you ever bend the truth, was simply when you're asked something like, did you think my singing sounded really good? Honey, does this dress make me look fat? Which the correct answer is no. But you may feel like you're lying. Do you ever bend the truth to preserve someone's feelings? Do you, do you bend the truth? Do you tell white lies? How about this? Do you ever lie by omission? So you, you don't not tell the truth, but you don't tell, what do we say on the witness stand? The whole truth. And usually our response when they find out that we've not told them the whole truth is something like, well, you didn't ask that question. Why didn't you tell me this was going to happen? Well, you didn't ask. We know that sting. Here's one that I think we're all guilty of, probably even today. Do you ever use sarcasm to mask your true feelings? Whenever we use sarcasm in our house because... I've been known to have a sarcastic comment from time to time. I'm always reminded that in every little bit of sarcasm, there's some sense of truth, but it's a, it's a hidden truth. It's an omission of truth. It's something that I'm going to say and try to make it a joke, but I really truly believe it. Sarcasm, that's dangerous. Do you ever gossip or slander someone? Now, at first you might be saying, well, that doesn't really sound like breaking an oath, but we use this kind of technique, we use slander, we use gossip in our deal-making, in our promises, typically to try to convince someone to come to our side as opposed to the opposition. When there's a disagreement, when there's a conflict, when there's a contract dispute, we go into gossip or slander. And I just want to add this, this little bit here at the end of gossip and slander, I want to add the word venting. Venting has become the acceptable form of gossip. Have you guys ever done this? Where you're frustrated with someone at work, 
And that boss that just doesn't understand you, because managers never do, he's come down on you multiple times, and you finally go to one of your coworkers, and you say, he just doesn't get it. He just doesn't get it. Managers don't understand. They don't get what it's like. They've never been in my shoes. But before you know it, that, that what we call innocent venting, I'm just trying to get it off my chest. I'm just trying to process out loud. It quickly slides into character deterioration. It quickly slides into us going from expressing our feelings to expressing our feelings about a person. We have a saying that I like to teach um, people in, on our staff and, and other people that I've talked to in other church ministries. You know, when you have a problem with someone and you need to talk to them about it, but you go to a third party, if you come to the third party and you have a problem with a person, make sure that person's in the room with you. Bring them along. I can tell you from experience, my position often requires me to say something along the lines of, I understand you have a problem. Do you want to talk to me about a problem or about a person? And if you want to talk to me about a person, they need to be here. We need both sides. Because integrity gets challenged when suddenly we slide into gossip, slander, or venting. Be careful with venting. Lastly, do you ever commit to doing something when really you'd rather say no? You know, one of the hardest words in the English language to say is no. Did you know this? It's hard to say, not because of its pronunciation, but because of the impact it has in our hearts. Now, some of you are better at this than others. Some of you struggle with telling people no, and you end up slammed and busy and constantly running and going and doing different things that you maybe didn't have the time to do. Where does this drop off when we ask the question of integrity? You double commit. You overbook yourself because you couldn't say no the first time. And so now you've got two things that you've committed to doing, but you can only do one thing at a time. And de facto, you have to go back on your word to someone. I would even add this, especially if you have a family that's counting on you to be around, mom, dad, brother, sister. You're always saying no when you say yes. And did you know this? If you say yes to one thing, you are saying no to something else. When you look at your weekly schedule, if you've been asked by four different people to do four different things all on the same day, you can't say yes to all of them. So even the one you choose to say yes to, you've got to say three no's. Now, many of you might have just got very squeamish at the idea of even telling someone no and disappointing them or letting them down. But I tell you, you will let people down more, and it'll be a greater challenge to you to have to recant and back out of what you've committed to. If you commit to something, be prepared to follow through. If you can't commit, say no. My friends, all, all of these are examples of fine print promises. We've all made them, and they're sinful of us to do. It's false oath-making. Praise God that we have a Savior who knew that we would be people who struggle with honesty and integrity, a Savior that knew all of the little lies that we would tell, all of the white lies that we would say, all of the secret deception that we hide in our heart when we overcommit and know in our hearts that we shouldn't have. All of those little lies and deceptions have been paid for by Christ on the cross. We can be thankful for His grace, His forgiveness, and His mercy because of this. And every time I think about all the times that I have been deceptive in my entire life, I cannot help but sing praises to God for a Savior who, even though He knew all of that, continued to love me and gave Himself for me. Now, if we want to grow as Christians, we need to become people who are serious about integrity we need to put aside the, fo the foolish oath-taking, the, the exaggerations. We need to people, be people who say what we mean, mean what we say. We commit, we follow through. We, we need to be people who are committed to integrity, even if it may hurt some, even if it may cost us in the end, even if it may 
cost us money. It may cost us a job. It may cost us our career, our profession. We need to be people of integrity. Jesus simply says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. I think another way to say this would be, we need to be so honest. We need to be such an example of upstanding citizenship that our yes and our no is enough because we have integrity. We don't need to swear in like we do on the witness stand every day when we make a commitment to a friend or to a neighbor or to a loved one. We just tell them yes or no. And because our lives are marked by integrity, we can be trusted. Remember, we represent the Father of truth. And Jesus Himself is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. But if it was easy, then there may not even be a reason to mention it. In 1987, Coach Cleveland Stroud, the first black head coach of a school in Rock County High School in Georgia, I believe, began a season with 15 players on the basketball team. Stroud cut five players who failed to make the previous semester's grades. And yet, despite having five players from the JV team have to move up, Rockdale finished the season at 21-5 and five and made the state tournament. The Bulldogs surprised the number one team, Bainbridge High, in the semifinals, and then had a dramatic 62-60 come-from-behind win over Fulton in the championship game to claim the school's first basketball state title. And a month after the state championship, Coach Stroud was reviewing grades on a Friday afternoon prior to spring football practice when he discovered that one of his sophomore players who moved up from JV had been academically ineligible. The player had played for 45 seconds in the first tournament game when the team was leading by 23 points. And Stroud had a dilemma. If he revealed the minor infraction, his team would likely be deprived of their state championship. If he kept quiet, it was unlikely that anyone would ever discover the offense. But he knew. And if he kept quiet, his state championship would always be tainted with an ugly little secret. Stroud thought about it all weekend, and he knew what he had to do. On Monday morning, he was waiting in Principal Henry Gibbs' office when he arrived. My heart hit the floor when Coach Stroud told me, Gibbs said, but there was never any question about what we had to do. We were wrong and we had to turn ourselves in. They reported the infraction later that day to the Georgia High School Association. A month later, the state association stripped Rockdale County High of their championship and asked for the trophy to be returned. Many Bulldog fans were angry about the turn of events. The kid only played 45 seconds. He didn't even score. How could the Georgia Association strip the Bulldogs of their title? Soon after those events, Coach Stroud had a team meeting with his players, and he said to them, in a few years, people will forget the score, and even who won, but they won't ever forget what you're made of. In Rockdale County, Georgia, people have long since forgotten the Bulldogs' state championship details, but they have never forgotten Cleveland Stroud's integrity. Beloved, people may forget all the things we do in this life from birth to death. They'll forget our successes. They'll forget our failures. But integrity is a legacy that can survive time. Lack of integrity is a legacy that could survive. So leave one that says something great, not just about you, but about the one who has saved you the one who we do all things for His glory and for His honor, including our honesty and our integrity, so that when we pass from this life into eternal life with Christ in heaven, we can hear those six words from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, thank You this morning. 
for letting us worship you, for giving us breath in our lungs, for letting praise come from our lips. And we ask you, God, that you would be with us to strengthen our convictions, to teach us and shape us by your word, to help us to be honest with ourselves, with our friends, with our families. Let everything we do be for your honor, for your glory. You're the one that saved us. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen.